I'm pleased to say I'm joined by Brookfield's head of Europe, Sekunder Rashid, joining us, overseeing about $210 billion for this region. He's here with me in Paris. Lovely to have you. Thank you for joining us here Thanks for having in me. Paris. I feel like you are the AI guy, and so we're going to get to that in a moment, but you're also wear the hat of head of Europe. So let's start there. We're sitting here in Paris. We're talking about Europe having this moment of attracting capital from around the world. Why and does it stay? Yeah, look, Rudy, I would say um, the U.S. market is very robust at the moment and the European market is constructive. And the reason I say that is the U.S. consumer is strong. The U.S. GDP is two times higher than that of uh, Europe. The U.S. has got a business-friendly administration, and all of that bodes really well for M&A activity. And we've seen $1 trillion of M&A deals get done in the U.S. in this year alone. Europe, on the other hand, the story is slightly different. One, the consumer is relatively weak. GDP growth is hovering around 1%. Despite that, we're seeing deal activity. So we've sold our port assets in the UK in a $2 billion transaction. Brookfield also sold right here in Paris uh, $4 billion of stabilized data center assets. And looking ahead, we remain bullish on Europe because interest rates are lower. GDP is now heading finally in the right direction. And Europe as a continent still needs trillions of dollars of capital to upgrade the existing infrastructure and to build new infrastructure for AI, and that is very exciting. Viewers of our program, The Opening Trade, will know that I often cite the valuations and the public markets, my two favorite companies, NVIDIA and Rheinmetall, as they get kind of this AI hype. And it was shocking to me when I used our handy-dandy Bloomberg terminal, I saw that the Rheinmetall valuation is juicier than that of NVIDIA, and NVIDIA is already trading at such multiples. It begs this question of valuations in the public markets. In the private markets, are valuations frothy? Are they juicy? How are you thinking about it? Yeah, look, I would say uh, at Brookfield, we are, whilst technology firms are building the brain, uh, we are building the body for, for AI. And what that means is we are building the power plants, we're building the transmission lines, the distribution lines, and the data center assets, or the, or the kit that goes inside of that uh, data, data center. And uh, I would say the valuations on that front, so long as we are investing in the right locations, uh, we are investing with the right counterparties, and signing long-term contracts, I think we're still earning very strong risk adjusted returns. All right, let's go, in, let's go into your specialty here. You mentioned AI there. The AI build out in Europe feels to be that it centers around the energy security question specifically. How true is that? Can you still, are we still at the infrastructure build out stage or are we at the adoption stage when it comes to AI? Yeah, look, I would say it's a bit of both. And energy, in fact, is the bottleneck. So people always talk about, is energy the bottleneck? Is capital the capital the the bottleneck is adoption, the bottleneck. I would say today it is energy and it's not generation. Generation will never be the bottleneck. It's the transmission and the distribution or the energy grid. And But there's two solutions to that. Previously, electricity was brought to the computing centers. Now, the computing centers, because of this grid problem, are being taken to the electricity generation sites. So that's the first solution. We'll see uh, more build out here in France because there's enormous amounts of nuclear power here. We'll see higher levels of build out in the Nordics where we have lots of clean power. Uh, that's, so that's the first solution. The second solution is on site generation through fuel cells or small modular reactors within the next few years. So you talk, and you've said this in previous iterations as well, that France, because of that energy source, is really the leader when it comes to that AI build out. But what about the other parts of Europe? When we talk about the UK, when we talk about Germany and their fiscal spend promises, how does the AI playbook apply in the rest of Europe? Yeah, look, I would say, Kriti, Europe for AI is a very exciting place. And the reason for that is, Europe is probably four to five years behind the U.S. So as a continent for infrastructure build-out, it is an ideal location. Now, having said that, your question is, what is the right market in Europe to invest in, in AI? I would say it's either markets that have a big infrastructure gap, and I would say those are the U.K., Germany, as you mentioned, and France. These are big economies that will require large-scale build-out in the next few years, or it's markets where there's abundant clean power, and I would say that's Nordics today. All right, I'm going to ask you a left field question. You oversee a lot in Europe and a lot in AI. What keeps you up at night? What are you worried about? 
Look, what I'm worried about is uh, we have a big business. We have 210 billion in assets in Europe. Uh, on the AI side, we have 155 billion dollars in total assets around the world, and we have an amazing platform today. We've been investing across the entire AI value chain for the last several years, if not decades, uh, particularly on the power side. What keeps me up at night is we have we have a great business. The future is bright. We're excited about it. Um, we need to continue to work with the best customers and continue to build in the best markets. And as long as we do that, I think it will be uh, it will be a really good outcome for us. Well, I'm glad you brought that up because there is a fear, and we see this in the public markets, we see it in the private markets as well, that so much of the momentum that is fueling the interest in Europe right now is driven and incentivized by public spend and fiscal spend getting pumped into the economy. Have you, when the clients you're speaking to and the partnerships that you're making, especially with some of the AI players out of the states like Microsoft, among others, for example, is there any fear, are you hearing in the ether, any concern around the fact that the full fiscal promise won't actually come to fruition? Yeah, look, we haven't, we haven't uh, heard that, particularly from our clients. But what I would say, Kriti, is we are in a moment where it's a great opportunity for private investors. And the reason I say that is, I'll go back to my earlier comments. First, uh, Europe needs a lot of capital in the next few years, trillions of dollars of capital to upgrade infrastructure and build new, inf new, inf new infrastructure uh, at a time when debt to GDP ratios in Europe are at all time highs. So in France, two weeks ago, we hit 114%. In the UK, I believe we're just over 100%. And that backdrop bodes really well for private investors. And what the governments, I believe, will have to continue to focus on is the right frameworks for public-private partnerships, where governments and private capital together solve that fiscal issue for the government whilst facilitating funding for the build-out of large-scale infrastructure. And I would also say that our announcement here in France uh, from a few months ago with President Macron to build out $20 billion of AI infrastructure in France is a perfect example. Sovereign governments have realized data security and data sovereignty yeah. is, is, is critical in the short term. It's a great way, construction projects are a great way to stimulate the local economy. Medium term, AI can solve the productivity issue for, for, for Europe. And the governments want it to happen, but their balance sheets are stretched and they want to work with operators yeah. Uh, like us, who can build and fund, and that's a perfect example of what a, tri a future triple P arrangement between governments and private investors can look like. You led me right to my final question. We're sitting here in Paris. You talk about this very bullish investment landscape for AI, but specifically for France as well in the partnership you laid out. There is a concern, though, as the French government deals with some of these fiscal concerns. Does that mean doing some disincentivizing some business-friendly policies, things like a wealth tax, things like fundraising measures that could weigh on international money entering the system, but also domestic money looking to make those big investments. Are you seeing that dampen some of the optimism around France? Not at the moment. Look, we have over $30 billion of assets right here in France. Our businesses continue to perform extremely well. And what you just outlined, it's, this has been the story on and off for the last 10 to 15 years in some of the European economies, but we remain bullish on Europe because, as I said, the economies are heading in the right direction. There is a bit, little bit of a geopolitical tariff overhang, but rates are lower. There's pent up demand for infrastructure, and I think that bodes really, really well for an investment in the next uh, two to five years. Lovely to see you. Thank you for Thanks your time. For having me. Of course, always. Sekunder Rashid there, the head of Europe over at Brookfield. Like I said, overseeing about $210 billion in AUM for this region alone.